This Week in Microbiology. This is a special episode recorded on October 26, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. I'm coming to you today from San Diego State University in San Diego, California, and my special guest is a professor of biology here and dean of the College of Sciences, Stan Malloy. It's great to be here. Good to it's be nice to talk to you at home. At home. We're <laughs> outside in the middle of campus, more or less. Right. We have this neat uh, building behind us, and the bells are just ringing. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> How about that? So I'm in San Diego for other purposes, and I thought it would be great to get together and have you on one of my podcasts because I think you were on the first episode of TWIM where we talked about a paper, but I wanted to talk about you and your work. Yeah, that's Sound great. Sound like a plan? Absolutely. Sounds like fun. All right. Uh, we have a nice California day here, which is what they all are, right? It's this is nice. the way it is all the time. You can hear the birds singing. Yeah, and the birds. It's nice. You can be outside in short sleeve shirts in January. Yeah. I'm going to go back home tonight to the cold fall weather, but that's fine. So let's start by uh, exploring a little of, of your education and history. And Are you from California originally? I am from California. I'm actually from a family that was in California while we were still a part of Mexico. Wow. So I'm a real native. And this, this area of California, Southern California? My family was in Northern California, but my mm -hmm. parents moved down here and I was born in San Diego. And where did you go to high school in this area? Well, no, I went to high school up in the Los Angeles area. All right. So, and, and then college was then where? I went to UC Irvine. Okay. In Southern California. And where did what did you major in when you were at Irvine? I, I majored, well, I went through a variety of phases. Mm -hmm. I started off majoring in psychology and then in chemistry and then in biological sciences. Okay. So you were interested in sciences for a long time before that? I, I, actually, um, I've always been interested in sciences, mm -hmm. but I didn't think I would be a scientist. I graduated from high school early and I thought I was going to, going to be a chef, and I spent time working in restaurants before I went to college. Okay, so you were a biology major at Irvine, and then did you immediately go to graduate school after that? Uh, so, when I was, I have a little different story. When I yeah. was an undergraduate, my older brother and I had a company, and we set up clinical labs for hospitals. So we would go in, buy all the equipment, train all the people, run the lab for a few months, mm -hmm. and then we'd leave and go to a new place and do the same thing. And so I was going to continue doing this with my brother. And when I was a senior in my last quarter of college as an undergraduate, I took a microbiology class and I said, this is what I've got to do with my life. Yeah. So it was a class that turned you on it to was microbiology. A class. So the clinical labs you were setting up were just blood chemistry types of oh, labs? It, they were all a full clinical lab. So yeah. it had microbiology, it had uh, clinical chemistry, it had the whole shebang. My brother had a license, so he, mm -hmm. I could do a lot of the work and he could sign off on things. So it was a perfect combination. So, so it was his stimulus that got you interested in that because he had been yes. running that business, right? right. Um, so where did you go to graduate school? So uh, I actually, I got interested in uh, going to graduate school when I was in my last quarter of my mm -hmm. senior year. It's way too late to apply for graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I ran over to Long Beach State University, mm -hmm. which wasn't far away, and said, would you take me? <laughs> and I, I had pretty good credentials, yeah. so they said, absolutely. So I got a master's at Long Beach State. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up going back to UC Irvine as a PhD student. Who did you work with there? I worked with a guy called Bill Nunn. He, he died young, and so a lot of people don't know him. But he really had a big impact on our understanding of lipid metabolism. So you didn't do a microbiology PhD? I, I worked on bacteria, mm -hmm. but I was really focused on trying to understand basic aspects of biology. I was really interested in uh, lipid insertion in membranes. Okay, using bacteria as subjects to yeah. study that. So yeah. you had gotten interested in microbiology as in, in college. Did this further that interest, this, this PhD work you did? It, you know, everything I did from then on just made me yeah. more and more convinced, <laughs> one, that I love bacteria, and two, that this is what I wanted to do. Right. All right, so you, you completed the PhD. What was the next step in your training? So, I did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Utah, 
with John Roth. It was the best time of my whole life. Mm -hmm. Being a postdoc is a wonderful experience. You can really focus on science. You're, <laughs> you, you know a few things instead yeah. of a starting yeah. graduate student. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and John Roth was a great mentor because he really focused on thinking, not just did you get this result? It was, what do you think about this? What does this mean? Big questions. Mm -hmm. What did you work on in this lab? So I began working on salmonella, and I was very interested. So I told you before, I was interested in membranes. Right. And I was interested in how proteins associated with membranes. And uh, what, what is it that regulates that? It was based upon this idea that the composition of membranes, the lipid and protein, really has to be at the right ratio for them to work right. And what is it that controls that ratio? Okay, so then after your postdoc, you, I, I presume you got your first faculty position. Where was that? I went from there to the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and I stayed there for 18 years. Now I remember when we discussed Carl Woes, Right. You talked about your years there. Absolutely. That's right. So you were on two TWIMS, at least, not right. three. Uh, so you, you had Carl Woes as a faculty member, Norman Pace as well, is that correct? No, Norm had left before then, but okay. Norm came by quite a bit. So. All right, so in those years you started your lab to work on salmonella, membrane biochemistry, That's essentially? That's right, yes. And you spent 18 years there, you ran a lab, you trained students and postdocs, the usual. Well, and then did you come here at some point, or was there I, another? I came here in uh, 2002, and so in, in addition to doing this stuff at, at Illinois, I've been involved at Cold Spring Harbor quite a bit. Right. So I, for five years, taught the Advanced Bacterial Genetics course there, this wonderful summer intensive course. I was involved in teaching in the Watson Graduate School, started a meeting there with a colleague of mine, Ron Taylor, and done books there. A lot of things at Cold mm -hmm. Spring Harbor. And I always, I love Cold Spring Harbor. There's, it, it's 100% science. Mm -hmm. They fix your meals for you. There's a room you can go to. You don't have to do anything but think right. science right. 24 hours a day. And there's always smart people around to talk to. And so I said, this is what microbiology needs, right? I mean, Cold Spring Harbor has done this for molecular biology, for cancer research. Mm -hmm. Microbiology needs something like this. And one of my students, who's a professor at UCSD, Joe Poliano, said, you talk about that your whole life. You're never going to do anything. <laughs> he said, you're going to die, and it's just going to be a pipe dream. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that's hard. Uh, so. It, I, I was thinking about doing this and originally thinking of coming back and starting something as an independent institution mm -hmm. here in San Diego. And uh, in the process, uh, was involved in building some connections within the community. Mm -hmm. And Elio and Schechter, who's frequently on TWIM, was involved very closely in that. Um, but then I got waylaid into uh, setting up something different and was hired here at San Diego State. So now the memory is returning. We did a podcast, a twim at Cold Spring Harbor to celebrate it being named as a milestone right. in microbiology. And um, you were on that podcast with, with me and Washlo Shabalski and one other individual who works on mixobacteria right. whose name I don't remember. And um, I had asked Lynn Enquist to tell me a story about you. And he said, you used to come to Cold Spring Harbor meetings in a VW minibus. He had a long ponytail, and, and the door would open, and all these women would pile <laughs> out. So you would drive from Illinois to Cold Spring Harbor? No, this was uh, back before that, when I was a graduate student. So I drove from California. You drove to Cold from Spring California Harbor. to Cold Spring Harbor right. to take to do the phage or the bacterial genetics yeah. course. It was right. So I was a student in the course back yeah. when Lynn was one of the instructors, yeah, right. Tom Sohavi. You drove across country. It took you a week to do that, I presume. Yeah. About a week. Oh, you made a fun time out of it, right? Yeah. yeah you know, you can camp in, in a yeah, vehicle course, like that. Yeah, and of course. So, so uh, then you came out here, and you've been here ever since, San Diego State University. Yes. Then you continue to work on salmonella. I continue to work on salmonella in part, but, you know, th one of the fun things about science is what you work on changes over sure. time quite a bit. And so 
I began doing a lot of stuff on evolution of Salmonella virulence. And then um, more recently, we're interested in how virulence genes get transferred to new organisms in nature to evolve emerging pathogens right. that we couldn't right. have imagined before. So uh, let's do two things. Let's talk a bit about your science. And then you're very interested in education and communication, and we'll talk about that and uh, see where that leads. So Salmonella you, has been the, the microbiological love of your career. Yes. Can, can you tell Here, us? Let me tell you a story. Yeah, of course. So I, I was down in, in Peru, and I was teaching this course. And my, at the time, my son was a senior in biology, and so I took him down to be a TA with me which is never a good idea because your kid <laughs> is your harshest critic, right? right. <laughs> so uh, we taught this course and then I went down to this little tiny town in the south of Peru and uh, it was a very interesting talk because it was a Saturday night late and the room was not full of, there weren't that many scientists in this whole community, mm -hmm. but there were parents and grandparents and kids. It was a, a very interesting yeah. audience. And it's, sometimes someone asked me a question, and I was being a little overly dramatic, and I said, Salmonella is the love of my life. Guess what happened to me that night? Salmonellosis. You got salmonella, salmonellosis. <laughs> <laughs> it hurt you. So my son says, how much do you love Salmonella now, yeah, Dad? Right, right. Did you still love it after that? I still loved it. So what is Salmonellosis? Oh, uh, so Salmonella, so there's a couple of types of disease, but the common salmonellosis that most of us get uh, causes you to get really serious diarrhea mm -hmm. and, and vomiting and you feel like hell for several days, you're better in a week. All right, and what is the name of the, the organism that causes that? So there, salmonella is interesting because at one time there were 2,500 different types of salmonella, mm -hmm. different species. Mm -hmm. and now they've been grouped together into one species. So there are many, many different types. So salmonella typhimurium is one that is spread very commonly from mouse droppings. Salmonella enteritidis is the kind of salmonella you get from eating raw chicken eggs. Mm -hmm. um, th there are a lot of different salmonella and different outbreaks around the country will very often be caused by different types of salmonella. So the, the salmonellosis you acquired in Peru was foodborne, you think? It was foodborne. It was actually, I'm pretty sure I know where I got it from eating raw chicken. Not a wise thing to do, but wow. I thought my immunity was such that... All right, so chicken harbor, chickens harbor salmonella, and they're fine with it, right? So they're, they're a carrier of the bacterium. And then we, if, and when you're preparing chicken, um, before it's cooked, you can contaminate your hands with it. Yeah, absolutely. Is this, is this something that could happen anywhere in the U.S.? It could happen anywhere in the entire world. And, um, you know, nowadays the FDA has rules where they're supposed to do some screening for salmonella in our chicken supplies. But in reality, you can't be 100% effective. Okay. And then you said you could get it from mouse droppings as well. That's less common, I would presume. Well, Maybe not. There's a lot of mice out there. So people have mice in their homes and right. fecal contamination in, in a variety right. of ways. You wouldn't get it by inhalation, right? No. no. Like, like hantaviruses from mouse urine. No. no, not at all. It's really from the mouse droppings. So a mouse at night could crawl over your silverware and your drawer and contaminate it, and you might right. acquire it that way or, or food. Okay. Yeah. Salmonella. What is right. the incidence but of salmonellosis globally? It's it's very common globally. Yeah. It's uh, you know, and and it, no matter what we do, there will always be salmonellosis around us. But there's another type of salmonella infection that's different, and, and that's caused by salmonella typhi, mm -hmm. a very specific one, and it's unique for humans. And it'll cause disease in humans, but it doesn't even cause disease in higher apes very effectively. Okay. Right? And where do we acquire that? And we get that from other humans. So it's a salmonella is fecal oral. Right. But so if somebody doesn't clean their hands very well when preparing your food, you can get that. It's, this is very rare in the United States, but it's pretty common elsewhere in the world. And it's different. You don't get mm -hmm. the diarrhea and the mm -hmm. vomiting. You get a really high fever. And often you have to go to the hospital and uh, it can give a very prolonged incidence. Mm -hmm. And then 
a high percentage of the people, somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, become carriers mm -hmm. where they'll shed mm -hmm. the salmonella for a long period of time, even though they're healthy. Right? So this is the story of typhoid Mary. Right, and that's why you would get it from one of these asymptomatic shedders, right? right. But they don't shed forever, it's limited, but it's now, enough to transmit. We actually don't understand shedding very well yet. Some people shed for a long, long period of time. Some people will shed for three months, and then it will end. Okay. Tell us the story of Typhoid Mary. So Typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary, so this comes back to Cold Spring Arbor, too, because Typhoid Mary was an Irish cook in New York at a period of time when the Irish weren't considered the highest class citizens, and there were a limited number of things they could do. And for a single woman, being a cook was one of those things. And she was apparently a really good cook, but um, she got jobs working for very wealthy families, and one of which was uh, out on Long Island in Oyster Bay, very close to Cold Spring Harbor. And she was there for a while, and then people started falling sick, and someone in the family died. Uh, obviously, they weren't in need of a cook at that point, so she moved on. And she did this at a number of different places. Finally, there was a public health officer in New York who figured this out, chased her down, and said, you can't cook anymore, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so she promised that she wouldn't cook, and she started doing laundry, but it, it wasn't very lucrative. She didn't see any symptoms herself, so she thought, this is crazy, why can't I cook? <laughs> and she was good at cooking, she liked cooking. Yeah. So um, she went back to cooking, the whole thing started over again, and a number of people died, and ultimately they moved her to a little island in the middle of New York Harbor where she was in quarantine for the rest of her life. Interesting. So. And quarantine, it doesn't sound like a civil libertarian thing to do, right? I believe this was the first case where a lifetime quarantine like that was ever imposed wow. in the United States. Now, in retrospect, knowing what we know today, was, would there have been anything we could do to make her no longer a carrier? So nowadays, if you have somebody who has that carrier state, you can treat them with antibiotics. Sometimes the bacteria are associated with the gallbladder, so removing the gallbladder can help. Um, there's a variety of things that we can okay. do. Uh, but in addition, as, if somebody knows that they're a carrier, and they take the right kind of precautions, yeah. they can really limit the transmission of disease. So I would guess good hand hygiene would help. Perhaps good if hand hygiene. We, we have given Mary some gloves, it would have made a big difference, right? Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> good hand hygiene helps in virtually everything yeah. in life. You know, it's interesting that, that we, we get on this quarantine issue because right now, as you know, Ebola right. is, is in the midst of an outbreak. There are cases in the U.S. and people are being quarantined uh, in some cases for having contact with people who are infected right. and many lawyers are questioning whether this is proper to do. Right. And in fact, I'm going to be talking with some lawyers this week who want to know more about the biology uh -huh. to try and make some decisions. So. so so, what do you think? So right now, uh, New York has just imposed this obli obligatory quarantine of 21 days for anyone with exposure coming back to the U.S. How do you feel about that? I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think if you're quarantined in your home, this is probably fine. You don't need to be quarantined in a hospital room somewhere. That's an unnecessary expense. But limiting your exposure to other people is just not a bad idea at all. You know, we have a case now in New York City of a physician uh, who came in before this new quarantine regulation was imposed. And he was traveling about New York and then one morning he developed a fever and now he's known to be positive for Ebola. So there's a lot of worry that uh, he might have uh, spread infection to others. You know, there's this, there's this dogma that 2 to 21 days is the incubation period during which you're not contagious for Ebola. But that's based on very limited observations in Africa where the conditions aren't optimal. And it could very well be that we don't know something. You know, so there's no evidence that you can transmit during that period. All the transmission seems to be with symptomatic patients. But maybe here in the U.S. we're going to learn something else. You know, someone today just came out saying that, in a way, this is like a punishment for the people from the U.S. who volunteer to go help. <laughs> they come back, yeah. and during that quarantine, you don't necessarily have any financial support right. for that time while you're in your house. Sure. So 
it, it is really a, a negative yeah. impact on the very people we want to go help right. solve this problem. Uh, you're absolutely right. Now, I look at it from a purely epidemiological standpoint, mm -hmm. nothing else. If you ask me, should there yeah. be quarantine, I, from a biological viewpoint, yes, but I understand that there are other issues. Now, in the case of a physician, he was an emergency room physician. It's probably a good idea that he wasn't allowed to work, right? Right, because yeah. You could spread it to many, many people. Yes, ER is a very crowded place. So it's a very interesting issue, which we can discuss in another podcast <laughs> entirely. But getting back to salmonella, so if you have salmonellosis, do you get treated with antibiotics? You can't. So if you have regular gastrointestinal disease, mm -hmm. you can go in and say, I'm feeling like hell, I want some antibiotics, and they'll give you antibiotics. But okay. if you have the antibiotics, the prob if you're otherwise normal, healthy person, the probability of extended disease goes up and the probability of being a shedder goes up dramatically. So the best thing to do if you're otherwise healthy is to um, let your immune system do its job and Be quarantined. suffer a little bit. Quarantine yourself. <laughs> Stay home, right? That's right. And use really good hygiene so that you don't spread it to other people in your family. So if you, if you had it here in California, you would resist the urge to go to work, right? Oh God, that's so hard. <laughs> yes, I would. Okay. <laughs> when you have it, yeah. uh, you're not in the mood to go to work. Okay. So, so um, is there are there efforts to make vaccines for salmonellosis infections? Uh, there have been a lot of efforts to make vaccines, and uh, the, and there are vaccines that are pretty effective with animals mm -hmm. now. The with humans, it's really not been quite as good. There are certain kinds of vaccines that will work very well in a U.S. population, but maybe not so work so well in a population from a developing country. And it's probably tied in to the whole issue of nutrition and all the other variables in how well our immune system can respond. Right. Okay. Now let's, let's touch a little bit about, over the years, your interests in, in, sal in salmonella. So one of the things you have on your website, and I don't know if it's up to date, you're interested in host specificity. Right. Is that, is that still correct? Absolutely. So tell us about that. Okay, so here we have two, we have Salmonella typhimurium and we have Salmonella typhi. Right. And if you look at their DNA sequences, they're about 97% identical. Okay? And you look at the known factors that can cause disease, and they share most of those factors. But I told you that Salmonella typhi can only infect a human Typhimurium can infect virtually anything that can walk, crawl, or fly on the face of the earth, mm -hmm. right? Insects, mammals, birds, fish, you name it, okay? So why? What's, what causes this really strong restriction, right? And in viruses, we know of some cases where it's due to a specific change in a specific receptor for a right. cell. Right? In bacteria, there are a few examples where we have some understanding of this. But overall, it, it's a big, big question. So uh, in, the, in the cases where uh, infection doesn't occur in a, in a particular animal, is it, do, this is not an intracellular bacterium, is it? Or is, it is. It is. It is. So it needs to get inside the cell yes. uh, and multiply. Do we know in those cases where infection doesn't occur whether it can get inside the cell at all? Yes. It can. It can and then infection stops at some point. Right. Does the bacteria multiply in lysosomes, for example, or does it get yeah. out into the cytoplasm? Yeah. It, it generates phagolysosomes that allow it to multiply very effectively. And a, a lot of these, so we now, I think, have a pretty good understanding of some of the things that are going on, right? Okay. So, so, so do you have, do you use cellular models to study this or animal models? So we used largely animal models. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, and actually, this ties into one of the issues that people were very concerned about today mm -hmm. with influenza. So our idea was, uh, can we convert Salmonella typhi so it has the ability to infect a mouse? And if we can do that, we've identified a factor or factors that are critical for that difference. Okay. Right? So can you do that? So it ends up that there are many, many, many factors that do this, <laughs> right? And a lot of the changes are changes where uh, mutation will happen in a gene, so it becomes a pseudogene, and so it, it's no longer functional. And so it, it, it makes Salmonella typhi more stealth 
allows it to be a lot sneakier in terms of evading some of mm -hmm. the host responses. Uh, but it's no one thing. Any one thing has a small effect, but you start adding them together and they're synergistic. So you can get salmonella to infect mice and you can get mul changes in multiple genes and you've been able to combine some of them and get... We've, we've never gone to the extent that we've made salmonella typhi a full mouse pathogen. And uh, we actually stopped doing that work at one point in time mm -hmm because of concerns really? by the government uh, about doing this kind of research. Not yes. because we were forced to, but we did it voluntarily. Yeah. So there was concern that if you made a, a bacterium that could infect mice, it could get out into the wild, and now you'd have a new reservoir. That's right. I mean, it, this is, salmonella typhi is something that can actually kill people mm -hmm. if they're not treated properly. And so instead of just having diarrhea, potentially that number of people might be yeah, exposed yeah. to real serious disease. Although so. you don't know if the adaptation to mice would then also confer a loss of virulence for humans, right? That's absolutely right. <laughs> it's a, a really, uh, I think, a very interesting question. I'm, I'm convinced that by understanding it, you'd be able to develop better approaches yeah. to respond. On the other hand, the, uh, there is a, a very strong concern from, you know, the, the general population a fear yeah. of this kind of research. Right. So right now there is an, on a movement to limit this kind of work. It's, it's been called gain of function, right. but I don't really like that term. That's a term borrowed from yeast. I that love is, that term. <laughs> that applies to a gene, right? You change the function of a gene and now all of a sudden it's applied to a virus. So I think there are better ways to, to huh. describe it. But nevertheless, as you, you mentioned, the, the ferret uh, influenza transmission studies fall under that. and. So the government has actually called for a pause in this kind of research on influenza, MERS, and SARS coronaviruses to address concerns to try and develop a framework for doing it in a more safe manner and figuring out whether, this part actually bothers me a lot, whether the experiments are valuable enough to do, which I always find funny because how do you ever know? Right. What, so do you feel that there are certain experiments we shouldn't do? I, I actually think that we would learn a lot from those experiments. Yeah. I do understand people's concern, and I think that as scientists we have to do things in a way that we can assure the public. Or the funds for doing this come from the public. I, I think that there would still be a fair amount you could learn from continuing yeah. these kinds of studies in Typhi. At the time, we didn't have good ways of controlling those issues. So, I think in general a dialogue is good. Okay. to explain what you're doing, and that's part of what we do on these podcasts. Uh, but I do think that people who have a dogmatic position who say these shouldn't be done and we need to stop them now, they're not doing the right thing either. Okay. Because as, as I'm sure you would agree with me, science is what makes our society what it is. It makes our lives what they are, and without science we'd be, we'd be dying a lot younger. No question about it. I mean, not just dying, the quality of life sure. would be a lot less. So you no longer do these kinds of host uh, specificity types of experiments? No. Is that correct? But, um, you know, whenever, as a scientist, you do one kind of experiment, it leads to another experiment. And one of the things that we learned there was that chromosome rearrangements mm -hmm. happen a lot in some bacteria. And so this led us to begin to work on trying to understand what allows chromosomal rearrangements? And so we, we move from there to spending a lot of time thinking about a fundamental biological problem. So by genome rearrangements, do you mean massive shifting of genes from one place to another on the chromosome? Yeah. So the, the chromosome of Salmonella, Typhi, and Typhimerium are circular, right. right? So in some cases, there'll be an inversion, a complete turnaround of one mm -hmm. part of the chromosome. In other cases, there's something, a levitation, where this part of the chromosome will pick up and move over to this part. Right? And these things in Salmonella typhi happen at a very high frequency. So the, in Typhimerium, they virtually, we don't see them. Mm -hmm. The chromosome mm -hmm. is stable from wherever you get Typhimerium in the world. Whereas with typhi, every single outbreak seems to have new rearrangements. So the question is why? What is right. it that determines that? But you can't answer that question. Oh, sure I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why? 
Well, so it ends up that, in fact, if you look at the rate at which these events happen in all of these different organisms, it's virtually the same. Mm -hmm. It's just that it has a, a cost to survival, a fitness cost, in bacteria that are growing quickly. And so you lose them from the population mm -hmm. because the guys that grow quicker take over and, and they're the ones okay. that win the war. In bacteria like Salmonella typhi, where they may set up shop in somebody's gallbladder and sit there for a long time and grow very, very slowly, mm -hmm. this cost doesn't matter to them, right? So, uh, so it just happens, okay. right? It, it doesn't provide a great benefit. It does provide a negative cost, but, but the bacteria don't care because they're just not growing fast enough to matter. You know, it reminds me of herpes viruses where they have a linear DNA genome that undergoes similar inversions. They're very, they're fixed, they're not random, and fixed, and, and they're all kinds of what we call isomers of the genome. And we don't know really why they occur. It may be that they can, and they're tolerated. Right. And that's, that's what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Basically. But there's no apparent benefit from doing this, although someday we might find one, who knows. Yeah. Right? But, but you know something, Vincent, one of the things that is really interesting about this is that when you talk about bacteria, there's a viral analogy. When you talk about viruses, there's a bacterial analogy. And for such a long period of time, they, they were such separate yeah. Yeah. disciplines. And it's nice to see a situation now where we're really learning from each other. Well, Stan, everything came from viruses. That's why that's so. All right. <laughs> I thought you would argue with me. No, actually, because I do work on bacterial viruses too, what can I say? So that's a good question. You've done, you've done, Salmonella has its phages. It's, right. it, you've used those over the years to study? Oh, absolutely. What, I, asked, what do you use them for? Uh, my lab was interested in a very fundamental question of how does the viral DNA get from the phage head on the outside of the cell across the outer membrane, mm -hmm the periplasm and the inner membrane into the cytoplasm of salmonella. And uh, it ends up that as a field, we were all very, very biased for a long period of time because there were these pictures of bacteriophage T4 that made it look like a hypodermic because yep. yep. it had this long shaft and it could inject things right there into the periplasm. But poor little P22 has this little puny shaft mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. way too small penetrate. And so some early studies had shown that what it does was it, it injects the DNA into the periplasm and no one knew how it then got into the cell. So we, we were really very, very interested in that question. And um, the answer to the question actually is that there are some proteins that are made by the virus itself that come in with the DNA that facilitate that process driven by the energy of the cell. Mm -hmm. So P22 is the name of one of the salmonella phages. Are there others that we might recognize? There are a lot of other salmonella phages, but probably not ones that you would recognize. Are these lytic phages? There are lytic phages. There are Both. many, many different um, types of phages. Um, and some of the ones that are lysogenic phages actually have a very important role mm -hmm. in different salmonella because when they're inside of the genome, they'll make it resistant to that particular phage. Right. So for many years when people wanted to figure out which salmonella was causing an epidemic, they'd do something called phage typing. Are you sensitive to this whole battery of phages? Mm -hmm. And it depended upon which yeah. phages were right. lysogenic in that. So uh, you, you told me earlier today that you, you have a collaboration with scientists in Georgia. Uh -huh. Not the state here in the U.S., but the country. And I know Georgia is well known for having done research for many years on using phages to fight bacterial infections. Have you ever explored that aspect of microbiology? I haven't uh, previously done a lot on that. I, of course, know a lot of people who work on it, and I've provided different types of phage to people who work okay. on it. But, the, um, but it, it really is a very interesting field. In, in some cases now, people are actually using these types of therapy primarily for um, foodstuffs right. more than treatment right. of animals. But I think that there is a lot of potential there. Um, Poor, sadly, if I can, sadly, Georgia 
has no patent control over any of this. <laughs> so. so phages, as we know, move genes from organism to organism. Is there any evidence in Salmonella that phages do that and that that has a role in virulence and pathogenesis? Yeah, so one of the things that we've become interested in lately uh, it has to do with the transfer of virulence genes in the environment mm -hmm. and largely driven by bacteriophage. So uh, one of our favorite sites, there's a estuary just south of here between San Diego and Mexico. So Mexico is only about 10 miles from us. Mm -hmm. we're, we're right on the edge of the country. And this estuary, the Tijuana River runs through, there's a sewage treatment plant and then all that water drains mm -hmm. into this estuary. Whenever there's a rainstorm, all of that sewage from the treatment plant flows over into the estuary. So we thought this is a natural place to study how new kinds of diseases evolve. Mm -hmm. right? And it ends up that if you look in that region, there are, uh, there are viruses that carry different kinds of exotoxin genes. So some that people might recognize are cholera toxin. Right. Uh, staphylococcal introtoxin, which causes staphylococcal food poisoning. Shigatoxin, which causes the diarrhea associated with Shigella or E. coli strains. Uh, so th there's a lot of these uh, phage that carry these toxins out in the environment there. And in some of the cases, when we looked in that environment, we don't see what's called the cognate host. So the, the tradition is that that Cholera interacts with the bac uh, cholera phage interacts with the bacterium vibrio cholera. When they come together, they cause disease. But cholera phage doesn't interact with any of these other bacteria. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, in some of these places, for example, we would find shigatoxin, mm -hmm. but we didn't find any of the E. coli or shigella. Um, and then we'd look and we'd find staphylococcal introtoxin. We didn't see right. any staphylococcus, right? right? So what would you interpret if you had that result? Well, there are two possibilities. One is that you didn't look hard enough. Yeah. We can rule that out. Uh, you can never rule that out. So they, they might have been there, but right. you didn't see it. Or that, in fact, the phages are not as host-specific as you think, and they can affect right. other bacteria and transfer those exotoxin genes to them. Is right. that reasonable? Yeah. So we tried as hard as we could to find these bacteria, and we couldn't find the cognate bacteria. So we, mm -hmm. we came up with the hypothesis that there are these alternative hosts. Okay. And sure enough, we have found alternative hosts, hosts that are environmental organisms that are carrying these, what we thought previously were human-specific exotoxins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now when you think about evolution of new diseases, it, it provides a, a, a fodder right yep. for how these kinds of genes can get transferred and what's going on so the idea that phages are host specific is probably not true because we don't know all the possible hosts out there right right so these bacteria that you've identified in the environment they're known species i presume right some of them are species that haven't been characterized very yeah. well but they're known yeah so they're it's probably a narrow view and you should assume that viruses can infect many more cells than we think so do you know the consequence of delivering these salmonella exotoxins to these other species? We don't know. So we're at the stage now where we're trying to figure out these things. You would like to know? We would love to know. So we'd also like to know how frequently are they transferred yeah. in nature. That's a, big, that's a big problem that involves both understanding ecology and, yeah. and molecular yeah. genetics. So that's a current interest in your lab? Yeah. It's a, and you go out and do some sampling now and then, right? We do sampling. You, you go yourself? No, not very often. <laughs> you probably I have like some to. wonderful students and postdoc, and they they do a, the sampling. It's so. probably not very exciting, right? You go to the river and you. You know sample. something. Most of us were in the lab so much every day. It's kind of nice to have an excuse to yeah, get outside. Sure. No, I mean I was. I, I collaborate with a scientist at Columbia, and they periodically go out and catch ticks to look for microbes that are in them and uh, it's, a, it's kind of fun to go outside and you take a cloth and you wave it through right. the bushes and you get lots of ticks. I would like to right. do things like that yeah. too now and then because yeah. it gets you outside like we are today right. here. Right, absolutely. Um, so exotoxins was one thing. But, so let me tell you something yep. else that goes from this though. 
the interest in exotoxins stimulated an interest in how environmental changes result in selection for new diseases, so mm -hmm. evolution of new diseases. And so that got me in, interested in this issue of global climate change and emerging infectious diseases. And so that's another area that we've really begun to explore. And in fact, uh, we have some nice examples of that in the estuary as well. Tell, can you give us an example? Well, so um, the abundance of certain organisms that are some clear and serious uh, pathogens mm -hmm. and the transfer of these uh, it seems to be associated with issues related to the environmental impact on the estuary, right. right? So estuaries are really good natural places of cleaning up things before they get to the ocean, right? That's basic. They serve as a big filter mm -hmm. of materials before they get to the ocean. But when the condition changes so that the estuary spends a lot of time in the dry state or in very heavy wet state, right. the rate of transfer changes and they lose their ability to, to clean up these types of things. Okay. Got right. it. Now one other area I gleaned from your website, you have something called novel vaccines. Oh. What, is that still an interest of so yours? Th that's still an interest and this is associated with a little company called Vaxion. So there's the disclaimer. Here in San Diego area? Here in San Diego. Uh, Vaxion began, began as a company to try to develop new vaccines and it's now shifted so its focus is more on delivery of, of anti-cancer agents. Mm -hmm. So the vaccine part is no longer a major thrust. But here's the basic idea. This is an, it's an old story that to my knowledge Roy Curtis III, mm -hmm. a very well-known microbiologist, was involved in. So you can take um, an E. coli cell, X big, and it's got a chromosome in it. And when it divides, it produces two cells, and each has a chromosome, so they can divide. And you can get certain kinds of mutations that instead of dividing into two cells, each with a chromosome, they generate a little tiny bud right. Right, called a mini cell. You know about mini cells? I've heard of them. Well, yeah, I'm impressed. Um, I've heard of schmooze also, you know what they are. Yeah, absolutely. It's a similar idea. General but, concept. But in yeast, yeah. yeah. So the idea was, with these mini cells, can you, since they can't divide, mm -hmm. they're dead, can you use them to deliver very effective antigens to a host? A nice part of this is that the outside surface of the bacteria have something called LPS that makes them a really, it's a good adjuvant, right. so it stimulates the host. So Roy Curtis worked on building these as vaccines. And the trouble was to produce these mini cells is kind of tricky yeah. because it's only a low percentage of the population and they revert back real quickly. So we developed a clever technique to make a lot of mini cells, mm -hmm. to get plasmids in the mini cells and to use them as a vaccine. And uh, it's been pretty effective so far, so far only in mouse models. Right. Um, but I think it may provide a new opportunity for a different type of vaccines. So you, I guess uh, you might have identified genetic control of mini cell production and used that to alter the, the frequency of their, of their synthesis? We developed a way for controlling the production so we can turn it on and now every cell in the population makes a mini cell. That's nice. And then we also develop, when you do something like this with vaccines, you always worry if you purify these mini cells, will there be one potential pathogen that sneaks in? That's an enormous problem with vaccines. Of course. Of course. So we, we built a, a suicide mechanism yep. for the whole cells. So yep. Perfect. we've got a nice little package. So you think this will eventually be used one day? I think that it has a lot of potential. Yeah. So. so what kinds of antigens could you put in? So the kind of uh, vaccine we were interested in making first is a vaccine that would protect you against a variety of foodborne pathogens. Mm -hmm. So it'd be nice to have something that could protect you against salmonella and common E. coli strains right, right. and um, maybe norovirus, mm -hmm. right? And it's, so you have a, a foodborne vaccine Things that you could take before orally. your trip to... You would, you would take this orally, I guess. Yeah. Oh, so that's the other nice thing about these. They're resistant to the gut, so you can take them orally. But w wouldn't it be nice to have something like this before you took your trip to some part of the world sure. where 
foodborne disease is rampant. Could have taken it before you went to Peru. It would have been great. <laughs> All right. Is there anything we're missing from your lab that we should talk about before we move to communicating? No, I think that's good. That's good? All right. So you're a dean of the College of Sciences. and. Did you have that position as soon as you came here or later on? Uh, I, after I was here for a few years. So what do you do I, as the I, dean? I had always thought that being a dean has got to be the worst job in I the do, world. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very surprised that you do it, but I'd like to hear what, what you do. You know, being a dean is interesting because there, there are so many different parts of science mm -hmm. that are changing rapidly. And very often, in what we do, we see some small part of it. Yeah. Small, very exciting, it's great. But in, as Dean of the College of Sciences, you learn about what's really exciting in, in astronomy. You learn about what's really exciting in chemistry. You have the ability to see something going on in chemistry and make a connection with a person mm -hmm. in physics and say, you know what, you come together, this is going to be really golden. Um, so, he, so it's really very different. You, you have more opportunities to, to kind of provide new approaches for people to work together and discover new things. So to do that, you have to know what's going on here. Absolutely. All the science. So you're, Absolutely. you're dean of all the sciences. Right. Not just microbiology, yeah. but chemistry. Yeah, so physics, let's see. Chem uh, astronomy, whatever. chemistry, computer science, geology, physics, psychology, mathematics. Oh, nobody from my college is listening because I forgot you something. forgot something. Oh, biology. I didn't say biology, I think. <laughs> is there a, there's not a microbiology department? Right? There is a section of microbiology within, within the biology. biology. So how do you keep up with all this? You know, um, people tell you things. I mean, as long as you ask <laughs> questions and you're open, it's, it's just like this. Yeah. You learn so many things from just sitting down and asking questions. Absolutely. Right? If you spent this much time asking questions to your colleagues, you could be dean. I'm trying, <laughs> one at a time. That's why I, not only can I learn by talking with you and all the other people, but I'm hoping the listeners are gleaning. They don't have to learn 100% of what we say, but if they learn a little bit each time, what's better than to have specialists talking I, among I, each I don't have to I convince agree. you. I agree, but, but in, just in case there is a listener out there who's thinking they might be dean someday. I actually think one reason I can do a good job as dean is because I'm a scientist. Yeah. I know how hard it is to get grants. I know how much work it takes to do a variety of the many things that professors are required to do. So I'm not asking somebody to do something that I don't do myself. And so I really think this idea of having scientists as administrators is extremely valuable. You've been interested in education throughout your career. Absolutely. You've taught oh, continuously over the years and you continue to teach courses now. Yes. So what are you teaching now? At so as a dean one of the things that's hard is to teach a whole regular course. Um, I do that on occasion and, and it kills me but it's uh, <laughs> uh, microbial genetics. I, it's a course I love to teach because I'm convinced that I understand genetics of mm. microbes in a very special way and I don't like to see other people do it because I don't think they can do it as well as me. <laughs> it's kind of a sad story but uh, yeah. um, but I also like to teach intensive courses so I do teach a substantial number of intensive courses around the world mm. and over the last year I've, I taught a course in Sweden, a course in Mexico mm. and a few other places in Chile. Now, I assume you're a really good teacher because I, I've seen you communicate. I've never seen you teach a course, but I've seen you do other things. What makes you a good teacher? We should teach a course together. Oh, that would be great. Wouldn't that be fun? We could do a course on scientific communication or something. I think that'd be fun. Do it. I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, anyway, but what, we'll talk about that. Okay. <laughs> what makes you a good teacher? You know, I think one of the biggest things is I still remember every time I'm up in front of a group, I remember being the kid sitting in class, listening, listening when somebody was boring or exciting or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, so I, I, I still relate to it. So when I'm up there teaching, I'm not just out with an agenda to mm -hmm. plow through something. 
I, I'm always looking at the faces of people and trying to figure out, did they understand? And I'll step back and re-explain it if necessary. I really try to engage my classes. So, And they must feel it as well that you try to do that. I think that's what students like to see in a teacher, that you're engaged and you're... Right. I think maybe passion for the subject I, is also important. I, I'm passionate for everything in life. <laughs> Everything, not just <laughs> I microbiology. I am, no, I'm really passionate for microbiology, but when you get up to speak to an audience, I think if you don't have some passion in what you're talking about, why should they care? Why are you passionate about microbiology? You know, it's an interesting thing, but I just, I just love microbes. <laughs> You know, Barbara McClintock, who worked on maize, yes. said she described her feeling for corn as having a feeling for the organism, right? That's the way I feel with bacteria. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just feel one with them. That's, I understand <laughs> what you're saying. You, you understand what makes them tick, right. more or less. Or you try, you're trying to, but you have a good sense beyond what most people have. You like to communicate also. You've done a lot of work for the American Society for Microbiology. There are lots of videos uh, at microbeworld.org of you explaining things and interviewing people. Why do you like to do that? Well, for a couple of reasons. One is that science is fun. Inherently, it's fun. And whenever, as we just discussed, whenever you talk to somebody, you learn new things. You go away thinking about things differently. So there's a personal benefit mm -hmm. underlying all of this. But the other thing is that you said a few minutes ago, science is critical, it saves lives, it really is important for us. And if people don't learn about science, if they don't see that scientists are humans who really care, they care about people understanding, they, they're not some kind of evil person hidden mm -hmm. in a lab, then we're never going to maintain the kind of support we need to do science well. And people will make bad decisions that ultimately influence all of society. So I think communication of science, it, it's, it's fundamental to everything that we do. I should point out that I'm currently chair of communications committee at ASM, and you were the previous chair. So you're very interested in science communication. Yes. And we've talked a lot over the years. And that's why it would be nice to teach a course together. Absolutely. Maybe I could come out here for a couple of months on sabbatical one day, one year, I should say, and do that, talk yeah. about it. But uh, so you must like these podcasts as a way of teaching I think science. this is a great way of teaching science. And I think that, so, you know, I think basically you need to reach different people in different ways. Mm -hmm. So the podcasts are really great because they provide really interesting, entertaining perspectives to a really broad swath of people. You do need other forms of what communication else? as well. I was going well. to ask well, you that, besides podcasts, what we, else do you think works? We still have a lot of people who read newspapers, believe it or not. Yeah. And so I think in the science in newspapers is very important. I think a lot of the miscommunication about Ebola came from newspapers. And so having people in newspapers who can communicate science well is also really critical for us. I think that the, some people, there's just so many different ways that people pick up science. The, just simply reading things on the web is a critical place where every crackpot can have their day. How does good science get disseminated on the web? Where do, if you don't know already, how do you know where to go to get good information? That's the problem with the web, right? It's great. There's a lot of stuff that you can find, but you don't know what is good stuff. Right. It's been, especially with respect to science, a lot of people make websites, they don't know anything about science, and they start writing about it. And the, how do people know what's good or not? Do you have any ideas of how to do that? Uh, I think it's an enormous problem that we need to figure out. The, you know, in, in San Diego, we're one of the hotbeds of the anti-vaccine movement, and a lot of that's disseminated on the web. People, you know, people who are in a real serious situation want to find anything, they'll latch on to whatever they can. And y you can't just negate it by saying that's not true, right? You have yeah. to 
uh, have some more strong, more forceful ways of doing it. CDC has a pretty good website. FDA has a good website. ASM has a good website. But if people don't know where to go for this information, if they just choose the first hit on Google, yeah. then we're in deep trouble. Well, of course, there are people who don't trust CDC or FDA. I don't know about ASM. They would, you know, ASM is a nonprofit that just is trying to promote microbiology, so I don't know why you would mistrust them, but some people might. I think ASM has a big role in disseminating the right information. I think we can do a better job that we're, than we're doing already. Um, I used to think that maybe a scientist working in the field would be a good source of information, but as you know, that can not always work. There are scientists who are not forthright and don't tell the truth and so forth. So that being a scientist alone is not a, a, enough of a credential right. to do that. So, I mean, we, we at, on communications at ASM, we think our members who are microbiologists would be good at communicating. We're trying to make ways to help them communicate because I do think that it should come from the scientists. As you know, I mean, the idea that journalism needs to improve its science coverage is great, but as you know, budgets for science writing is, are going down because it doesn't generate the kind of income that other stories do. I've always felt that you need to subsidize science communication because it's never going to be high profit, but it's so important that you need to have it out there. And I think newspapers who cut their science coverage are doing the wrong thing. Uh, one of my favorite podcasters, Leo Laporte, who has the Twit Network, used to have a science podcast. He cut it because it wasn't profitable. I think that's a big mistake. I think he should have eaten the loss in the sake of communicating science. And I, so I would argue that it's like something that you have to do in a nonprofit basis because it's so important that you need to do that. But So, you know, one of the things that got me interested in science as a kid was at that time, most, lots of homes got Life and Post magazines. Right. A lot of times Reader's Digest. And Life and Post, other than a lot of blood and gore and guts from the Vietnam War, they had a fair number of articles about science, right. different types of science, and they were done really well at the level a kid could read them and be interested or an adult could read it and be interested. Uh, Reader's Digest, every month it had something, I am Joe's liver or uh, I am <laughs> <laughs> something like that, right. that tied people into yeah. science. And so I think we consumed science in a different way then, and it was really tied to the impact of journalism. And I also think the importance of us to figure out yeah. new ways to keep doing that. Stan, I have one more question for you because the sun's getting hot and a lot of people are walking around now and I have a plane to catch. If you hadn't been a scientist, what would you have been? So I, I have a personality where I like to work a lot. So I mentioned earlier in the program that I was thinking about becoming a chef. I love that idea. In fact, it's not so different from doing science in some ways, but you can also work like crazy. The other thing that I think I would really enjoy doing is having one of those kinds of bookstores where you don't make a lot of profit, mm -hmm. where you have to work your rear off, and you have the ability to be exposed to so much amazing, brilliant knowledge, yeah. and the time to sit in there and read those books when you have a dearth of customers. <laughs> You're talking about a mom and pop bookstore, basically. Right. Are there any? No, sadly, not so many anymore. I'm not sure they can survive. People are going to digital, right? That's right. So, Stan, usually on TWIM we answer listener email. And on, when we have a special guest like you, I usually don't do it. But I had an email that I think you'd like to answer. And uh, it comes from Bradley, who asks, How long can food sit on a counter? Conventional wisdom is that Thanksgiving dinner leftovers must be refrigerated for two hours. For example, he gives a link to an, an article, true or false? It's hard, hard, hard to know. It seems so simple. <laughs> and uh, so it, it depends a lot on a number of issues because things like fat and protein that are present in Turkey can influence uh, how long it can sit outside. Uh, 
it depends upon the initial level of contamination. If you have a low level of contamination, you can leave it longer and it won't be enough to cause problems. If it starts at a higher level, it'll be shorter. I think two hours is probably what I'd say is the maximum uh, safety zone, but the less time it's sitting out, the better. All right. Stan, do you have any questions? You know, I, so what got you into this whole communication thing, Vincent? I mean, you, you've had a, an amazing career. You've done wonderful virology. You're a co-author on what is the best virology book out there. And then you started up this other effort, and it takes a lot of time and energy and effort mm -hmm. to do. I think, so I've always liked teaching as well. Since my first days as a faculty member, I enjoy being in front of an audience, having their attention, and being passionate about microbiology. So I'd like to communicate. And I got involved with the textbook quite a few years ago. And uh, at one point, so the way the textbook is written is different because it's, a, it's by process. It's not by virus. It's by attachment, entry, you know, RNA synthesis, and so forth and we each would write a few of the chapters. So we had to learn a lot of different viruses. And I, after that process, I had a lot of knowledge that I never had before. At about that time, it was possible to start blogging. It was easy, the software was easy. And I thought this would be a great way to share this with more people because you know we sell so many books, but not that many in the overall scheme of the world. So I started blogging as a way to communicate. And my blog now, Virology Blog, has quite a few readers every day, and I think it's very satisfying. But at the same time, I wanted to reach even more people, and I happened to have a very long commute, and uh, I found podcasts maybe 10 years ago as a way of listening to what I wanted to listen to. And I thought this was just amazing. You didn't have to listen to the radio and to ads. You could do whatever you want, make your own playlist. And I, one of the earliest podcasts I started listening to was This Week in Tech, twit.tv, Leo Laporte, who I mentioned earlier. And he said at one point in one of his podcasts, if you're passionate about something, you can podcast about it. And I took that uh, as a, tr a call to, to arms, a call to action. And I said, I can do this. And, you know, it's technical. And I'm a scientist. I figure I can figure anything out. So I figured out how to do it. And I, put a, I started This Week in Virology. And you know what? I thought it was an experiment because I figured no one would listen. But you know what? We now have tens of thousands of listeners. And we have This Week in Microbiology. We have This Week in Parasitism. I even started one on urban agriculture. Huh. So that's how it evolved. And it works because people, use, people consume what we make. And they're really interested in, in something that we talked about before, to hear scientists talking about their field. They love this idea that they can hear us. It's really hard to reach us, right? It's not easy. If you send an email to a random scientist, they're not going to respond for the most. But to hear us talking about it with a passion and a knowledge. I mean, I just got an email this morning. We get tons uh, all the time for all our shows. And this guy said, these are the best podcasts. He said, it's great that you don't dumb it down. I love listening to scientists talk tech. And... You know, I don't get it all, but eventually I learn a lot. And that's the key, and that's what keeps me going. I love this field, and I love talking to people about it. So if you, next year, all of a sudden, you quit being a scientist, your lab in Columbia disappeared, and mm -hmm. you had to do something else, what would it be? I'd podcast about science, for sure. I'd love to have a company that does life science podcast. I'd get my colleagues and other people who do different kinds of science. I'd love to have an entomology podcast, get some entomologists to talk about what they do. I, I don't have to be part of the show, but I, I can ask stupid questions, you know. I'd love to have a, a cadre of people working to do this and produce and distribute. I think we could raise money to do that. I do have it as a dream. I would really like to do it. Uh, I'm just wondering whether I need to stop doing my science or just take the plunge and try it and be brave. You know, I, I think the idea of having a second career, of reinventing yourself, is really appealing to me. Because you're right, I've had a, a lifetime of doing bench work. I think we've been good about it. We've done good stuff. Um, 
but I wanted to try something else, and maybe a second career would, would really be cool. So we'll see. Well, that's exciting, and thank you for all of the podcasts yeah, that you've welcome. done, and I think it really has impacted a lot of people. Thank you. Well, you were an inspiration as well, because you do a lot, do a lot of cool work at Microbe World with ASM as well. Yeah. You're a very excited guy about your science, and I think that's really important to do. So I hope I'm excited as well. This episode of TWIM can be found at microbeworld.org slash TWIM and also on iTunes. And if you have any questions or comments, we love to answer them. You can send them to TWIM at TWIV.TV. I want to thank my guests for this episode from San Diego State University, Stan Malloy. Thanks so much, Stan. Thank you, Vincent. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I love your enthusiasm for microbiology. That too. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, and in particular, Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for their technical help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.